Greetings to all of you beautiful embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. This video will be quite different. If you are a lover of fiction, this video is for you. If you only like nonfiction, I would go ahead and click away as this will not be the video for you. And with that being said, for those of you that listen to this video in its entirety, there will be a drawing. That's right. I will be giving away something to one of you all. <laughs> um, what I'm actually giving away, it's a light that clamps to a desk or a counter or wherever you want to clamp it to, and it helps shine light. So anyway, um, I'll be giving that away. And then the big prize, which is the speaker, that's coming up soon. So keep that in your little noggin. Anyway, on with the show. If you are new here, please join our family and hit the subscribe button. And don't forget to set your notification bell to on. So you know every time I upload a video. Also, today's video will not be set to rain or thunder or wind. Today's video will be set to creepy ambience in the background just because it's fictional and it is scary. So if that bothers you, I am sorry this won't be the video for you, but if it doesn't, let's move on. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes, and once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. So, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck, and get warm. And let's get into this fictional series. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll play an ad right before the first story, and after that, you can enjoy this story in all its glory, without any more ads interrupting your peaceful time. If you're ready, I'm ready. I think I've talked long enough. Let's get started. A killer gave us a list of instructions we have to follow or more will die. Part 1 the radio is low, playing I'm Getting Used to You by Selena as our unmarked Ford Explorer rolls down the dusty road toward the Tijuana River Valley. I adjust the rearview mirror, carefully scrutinizing myself. I see there's a trace of lipstick on the collar of my shirt. I hope the dim light will keep it hidden. I catch a glimpse of Audrey, her fiery red hair still slightly disheveled. She's gazing out the passenger window, the reflection of passing headlights glinting off her features. We both avoid eye contact. We haven't spoken much since leaving the motel room. Officially booked for deep cover surveillance work, though the only observation we've done was of each other. I promised myself the last time we did it that would be our last. The fear that gripped me when the condom broke was a wake-up call I couldn't ignore. Audrey's panicked eyes as she took the morning after pill are etched into my memory. We had been playing with fire, and that night we nearly got burned. Yet, here we are, slipping back into our old rhythms as if nothing had happened. You going to answer that? she asked, nodding towards my phone vibrating against the dashboard. The screen lit up again, flashing a picture of my wife, Rossio, and our boys. I pressed a button on the steering wheel, silencing the buzzing. I'll call her back later, I murmur, feeling a pang of guilt tighten around my chest. Audrey shrugged, her focus returning to the shadowy outlines of the landscape ahead. If you say so, Ramon, but it might be important. It's just Rossio checking up on me, I say, trying to sound nonchalant. Audrey shifts slightly in her seat, her eyes never leaving the road. Does she know about us? She doesn't, I say, keeping my voice steady, though a trace of defensiveness sneaks in. She's just been on edge since... Basquez case. After the shootout, she thinks every night might be the one. Uh, the one that ends with you not coming home? Audrey finishes for me, her voice softening. Yeah, 
I murmured, the weight of the words settling heavy in the car. A thick fog begins to roll in from the coast, shrouding the landscape in an ethereal veil. The light heads of the explorer cut through the haze, revealing only brief glimpses of the road ahead. As we approach the outpost, the sight before us is eerie. Silhouettes of border patrol agents, their form hazy and indistinct through the fog. They look less like people and more like ghostly centennials keeping watch over the edge of the world. The border fence stretched out into the Pacific Ocean, its metal bars disappearing into the misty waters, giving the entire scene a surreal, almost dreamlike quality. Ready? I ask, my voice a bit rougher than I intended. Yeah, let's do this, she replies her voice all business now. She glances at me, her expression unreadable, for a second before she turns away, focusing on the gathering shadows stretching before us. We step out into the chilling air, the ground beneath our feet soft with recent rain, and make our way toward the group of border agents. They look relieved to see us, understandable considering the circumstances. One of the agents steps forward, his face partially obscured by the brim of his hat and the fog. Detective Ramon Castillo, San Diego Sheriff's Department, I announce, flashing my badge. This is my partner, Detective Audrey Dawson. The agent nods, extending a hand, rough and calloused. Watch Commander Rick Martinez, U.S. Border Patrol. Thanks for coming down here on such a short notice. We've got a mess on our hands. What's going on, Commander? I ask, trying to keep my tone even. Martinez's eyes shift through the portable command post set up a few yards away. It's best if you see it for yourselves. The command post is a hive of activity. Radios crackle with static. Agents huddle over maps, and the air is thick with the smell of stale coffee and damp earth. Martinez gestures for us to step inside. He leads us to a set of monitors displaying grainy night vision footage. Pulling up a pair of chairs to a particular monitor, the commander motions for us to sit. He doesn't waste time with pleasantries. About three hours ago, one of our own infrared cameras caught a group of migrants moving through the valley. They were following the usual routes, nothing out of the ordinary at first. He pauses, his expression tightening. Then something went very, very wrong. Martinez hunches over the keyboard, his fingers tapping a rhythm on the space bar as he seeks out the specific clip. Here, he mutters, and the grainy footage begins to play the small screen. My chest tightens, a familiar pang of empathy. Though I was born here, my mom wasn't. She crossed marshland much like this, driven by hopes of a better life. Keep your eyes on the left side, Martinez advises. As the migrants shuffle through the marsh, one of them pauses, glancing back nervously. The infrared camera designed to pick up heat signatures suddenly reveals something chilling. A figure that emits no heat whatsoever. It's an anomaly, darker than the surrounding night, moving with an eerie, fluid grace. The figure moves swiftly, almost gliding over the ground. Without any warning, it strikes. The group of migrants erupts into chaos, scattering in every direction like a disturbed hive of bees. Screams pierce the night, although they're silent on the footage. The migrants, in their desperate bid to escape, are picked off one by one. Each time the figure reappears, a migrant drops to the ground, motionless. The figure's movements are precise, almost predatory, and terrifyingly efficient. Martinez pauses the video, and the screen freezes on a particularly chilling frame. One of the migrants, isolated, his heat signature intense with fear as the entity looms over him. The shape is amorphous, 
almost ghostly, a swirling mass of blackness and doesn't fully register as an identifiable creature. Shit, Audrey murmurs, her eyes not leaving the screen. What are we dealing with here? No idea, Martinez shakes his head, his eyes not leaving the screen. I've watched this over a dozen times. It's like nothing I've ever seen. Thermal doesn't pick it up right. It's cold, colder than anything alive should be. Any survivors? I ask, though I'm not sure I want to hear the answer. Martinez pauses the video, his jaw clenched. We sent a team in right after the camera lost them. They found clear signs of a struggle. Shoes stuck in the mud, dropped belongings, patches of blood, but the migrants? Nothing. No bodies, no survivors, just gone. He let out a heavy sigh, rubbing his forehead as if to clear away the grim images. <sighs> well, except one, he adds, almost as it was an afterthought. We found him half buried in the mud, unconscious, but alive. Who? I ask, my voice steady despite the churning in my stomach. Enrique Salazar, Martinez replies, dripping with disdain. He's been on our radar for a while. Coyote, drug muling, you name it. If it's illegal, he's dipped his fingers in it at some point. I lean forward, my interest peaked. Where is he now? In our holding area, Martinez replies. He's shaken up. Bad. Keeps saying things that don't make a lick of sense. We figured he was high, or maybe in shock. Audrey and I exchanged a look. Can you take us to see him? She asks. Uh, sure, I guess, Martina agrees, standing up. Come with me. He leads us out of the command tent and toward a smaller, more secure area where they're holding Salazar. As we approach the securing holding area, a battery old trailer encased in high voltage barbed wire, the muffled sound of shouting grows louder. Even though the thick metal walls, Salazar's voice carries a distinct note of hysteria. Mantele de los silencios, reina del estino, a tus bestes pito, mi temor más genuino. That translates to Mother of Silences, Queen of Destiny, at your feet I lay my most genuine fear. His words echoed in the night. He's been at it for hours, Martinez grumbles. As we draw closer, a young agent steps away from the trailer, his face lined with exhaustion. He straightens up as he spots Martinez, casting a wary glance at us as we approach. Agent Ortega here. Martinez introduces him with a nod. He found Mr. Salazar half buried in muck and babbling nonsense. Ortega nods in acknowledgement, his eyes flicking towards the noisy trailer. Whatever he's seen, it's got him scared shitless. Nothing he says makes any sense. We pause at the door, the metallic clang of the trailer echoing slightly in the still night air. Ortega unlocks the door, pushing it open with a creak. The inside of the trailer is dimly lit, the only light coming from a harsh fluorescent bulb that flickers intermittently. Salazar is cuffed to a bench at the end of the trailer. His clothes muddy and disheveled, his eyes are wide, darting around him in panic, and as the door opens, he recoils as if expecting an attack. The network of tattoos scrawled up his arms and neck stands out, the intricate designs unmistakable in the dim light. The most prominent among them is the Black Cobra that marks him as a member of the infamous Tijuana Drug Cartel. Martinez, unfazed by the man's disheveled state, addressed him with a firm tone. Hey, Salazar, there are detectives here to talk to you. Salazar didn't seem to register our presence at first. 
his gaze fixed on something only he can see. After a moment, he slowly turns his head towards us, his eyes narrowing as he tries to focus. Dulce Engel de Muerte, Escucha Mi Plegaria, translates to Sweet Angel of Death, Hear My Prayer, he mutters to himself. Martinez shrugs, standing back as Audrey and I move closer to Salazar. The stench of mud and sweat is palpable as we approach the cuffed man. He's still mumbling under his breath, his voice a mix of panic and delirium. I step forward, keeping my voice even. Mr. Salazar, I'm Detective Costello, and this is my partner, Detective Dawson. We need to understand what happened. Can you tell us what you saw? Salazar's eyes flit between Audrey and me, his breathing erratic. It was the devil essay, he begins, his voice dropping to a whisper as if the very memory scared him. A shadow that ate light, man. It moved through them like smoke through a chain-link fence. Audrey leans in, her voice soft but insistent. Enrique, we need you to focus. What did you see out there? Was it a person? An animal? Salazar shakes his head vigorously, his face contorted with fear as he glances around the cramped trailer, as if expecting the walls to close in on him. No, no, it, it wasn't a person. It wasn't an animal. It, it was wrong. Todo mal, he stammers, the words tumbling out in a frantic rush. It had... He pauses, his eyes widening. Una cadarrota. A broken face? Audrey asks, kneeling down to his level. Yeah, like it was shattered. C cracked all over, but still moving, breathing, watching. His hands tremble as he makes a motion in the air, mimicking something frightening apart. It looked at me, man, and I, I felt, I felt it in my soul. Can you describe how it moved or what it did to the others? I ask, trying to guide him back to specifics. It, it moved like fog, like mist. Salazar continues, his voice dropping to almost a whisper. It didn't walk. It, it floated, man. A and whatever it passed, people screamed, fell down, didn't get up. I ran. I, I ran so fast. His voice breaks and he looks down. The haunted expression etched deep into his face. Look, detectives, with all due respect, I don't buy this supernatural mumble-jumble. Martina speaks up, his voice a low rumble. It's more like cartel activity. The Sonola cartels, they've been known to take migrants hostage, use them for smuggling or worse. And him? He's been neck deep in that world. Shithead is just playing us. Audrey's expression remains impassive, but her green eyes are sharp, taking in every detail. So you think the cartel is dressing up their actions with... What? Legends? Superstitions? <laughs> it's not the first time, Martez admits with a shrug. Fear is a powerful tool. Make people afraid of ghosts or curses, and they won't look too close at what's really happening. Commander, can you give us a moment alone with the suspect? I ask, my voice calm but authoritative. Martinez catches the hint, his eyebrows lifting slightly. Uh, right. I'll give you some space. He makes a show of checking his watch. I need to check in with a command post anyway. Holler if you need anything. As he steps out, the metal door clang shut behind him. The trailer feels even more confined. 
I lock eyes with Audrey, and without a word, we both understand the gravity of the situation. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. We need to pry information from Salazar quickly. Salazar's eyes widen in fear as I grip him by the shoulders and slam him against the wall. His face hits the metal with a dull thud, and a trickle of blood seeps from his nose, staining his dirt cake shirt. His gasps, the panic palpable. I lean in, my voice cold and calculating. Mira Pendejo. What do you think would happen if we shipped you to RJD and locked your ass in a cell full of Sonolas? Detective Costello here, Audrey gestures to me, was undercover with the Sonola cartel for over a year. He's seen things that would turn your blood cold. Things that make your little devil story sound like a bedtime fairy tale. I pulled out my pocket knife, flipping it open with a swift, practice motion. The metallic click sounded unnaturally loud in the cramped space. I leaned in close, the cold still grazing the stubble on Salazar's neck. See, si, cabron, the Federation. They like to make examples out of rival cartel members, I growl, my voice low and menacing. They got this little trick called El Corde de Cordobata, the necktie cut. You know what that is? I draw the tip of my knife lightly across his skin, just enough to draw a bead of blood. Our Lady of Holy Death, may your bones be the fortress of my soul. Salazar whimpers a prayer. I paddle mine with a knife, tracing a line down his neck. They cut your throat open from here, I say, dragging the tip of my blade slowly downward. All the way down to here. I gesture towards his sternum, my movements deliberate and chilling. Oh, and then, I add, my voice cold and matter-of-fact, they pull your tongue out and through the slit, you'll feel it tearing through your flesh, the taste of your own blood choking you as you struggle to breathe. We can do this the easy way, where you tell us everything you know, and maybe, <laughs> just maybe, you get some kind of, I don't know, protection, or, Audrey chimes in, you get a brand new tie, I say, pressing the blade tightly, just enough for him to fill its bite. It spoke to me. Salazar mumbles, his voice barely audible. Not with words, but it's like it whispered directly into my mind. It said, follow the trail of the falling stars to the sleeping child. The fallen stars, Audrey presses. Salazar clutches at his shirt, his fingers trembling. He said, Dolce's, Dolce's. He mutters repeatedly, a single word spilling between labored breaths. Dolce's, I echo. Like candy? What's that supposed to mean? He doesn't seem to hear her, or chooses not to respond. His gaze is distant, unfocused, as if he's seeing something beyond the grimy walls of the trailer. Dolce's, Dolce's, he continues, the word becoming a mantra, obsessive and relentless. I let out a heavy sigh, realizing we're not going to get anything substantial out of him. I ease my grip entirely, stepping back. We're done here, I say, my tone dismissive. Yet internally, I'm filing every word away. Audrey nods and we step out of the trailer, letting the heavy door slam shut behind us. The cold night air hits us, and the sound of the ocean mixes with the rustling of the marsh grass. Martinez is waiting for us, his silhouette outlined by the dim lights of the command post. 
Anything useful? He asks. Maybe, I reply, keeping my cards close. We need to see the crime scene. The drive to the site is tense and silent. The SUV's headlights slicing through the thick fog like twin blades. The landscape around us feels alien, and the marshy ground and twisted trees casted eerie shadows on top of us. When we arrived, the scene is exactly as Martinez described. Chaos personified. The ground is churned up, littered with abandoned belongings and deeper grooves that suggest a struggle. The fog hangs heavy, muffling sounds and giving the whole area a claustrophobic feel. The area feels haunted by the terror that transpired, the silence almost oppressive under the weight of unknown horrors. Audrey and I began a meticulous search of the site, our flashlights piercing the fog, casting long shadows on the marshy ground. Every rustle in the underbrush has us tense, half expecting whatever caused the chaos to reappear. I started from where the video last showed the migrants, moving slowly, searching for any clues that might have been overlooked in the initial panic. Audrey takes the western flank, her steps deliberate, eyes scanning the mud for tracks and signs of disturbance. It's clear this was the epicenter of the panic. Shoes, children's, women's, a single man's boot are half buried in the mud. Picked up a small worn out teddy bear, its eye missing, and wonder about the child who held it last. The personal items are scattered as if their owners drop them and everything in a desperate bid to flee from whatever horror pursued them. Anything? I called after a few minutes, my voice low, wary of disturbing the dense fog that seems to swallow sound. Nothing yet, she replies, her tone just as tense. We keep searching, the sense of urgency mounting as the minutes stretch into an hour. I pause when I catch a glint of something metallic among the dense reeds. A flash of silver that doesn't belong in the muck. Crouching down, I brush aside the wet vegetation and find a small silver locket. The clasp is delicate, caked with mud, but still functional. I pop it open, revealing the photograph of a young girl, no more than 13 or 14. Her smile frozen in time within the confines of the locket. Scanning the ground, I notice more metallic objects scattered about. A keychain, a pair of battered dog tags, a twisted fork, a small brass bell, a couple translated tarnished coins, and a metal whistle, all lying within a few feet of each other. It's as if they had been deliberately placed to draw the eye, the gleaming metal stark against the dark earth. Hey, Dawson, look at this, I call over my shoulder. She's not far, her silhouette ghostly in the fog. She jogs over, her boots sucking at the mud with each step. Audrey kneels beside me, her flashlight sweeping over the scene. Look at how they're laid out, she murmurs, tracing the air with her finger. The items seem to form a pattern, each one pointing to the next, culminating in a rough shape. It's the Big Dipper, she whispers, a tone of disbelief in her voice. See? The handle here, and the bowl there. I look again, squinting through the fog and the dim light of her flashlights, and it clicks. She's right. The arrangement of the items, a seemingly random assortment of personal belongings in a deliberate depiction of the constellation. My mind races back to Salazar's frenzied babbling about the trail of the falling stars to the sleeping child. It couldn't be a coincidence. I remember learning about the Big Dipper and the Girl Scouts, Audrey murmured. 
we used to find Polaris, the North Star. It was like a game back then, using the stars to find our way back to camp. Her voice trailed off. With a renewed sense of purpose, she starts tracing the items, making up the makeshift constellation laid out in the marshy ground. The fork and the dog tags are pointer stars. Catching on to her intent, I follow her hand as she draws an imaginary line from the pointer through the fog, trying to pinpoint where the North Star should be in our earthly recreation. I signal the others with a sharp whistle, the sound cutting through the damp air like a knife. Martinez and other agents coverage on our position. Their silhouettes loomed out of the fog, each one appearing as if materialized from the mist itself. Form up, I command in a low voice, not wanting to disrupt the eerie silence more than necessary. We got a lead. Might be walking into a trap, though, Martinez warns, drawing his sidearm. We form a tight formation, moving with our weapons drawn, our senses heightened. Audrey's beside me, her P320 at the ready, her eyes darting through the mist. Martinez flanks us, his glock aimed low, his breathing controlled but audible in the eerie silence. The rest of his team fan out behind us, forming a loose perimeter. The fog thickens as we proceed, each step forward feeling like a descent into another, less tangible world. Visibility shrinks to mere feet. The world beyond our tightly formed group blurs into indistinct shapes and muffled sounds. The air grows colder, clinging to my skin with damp fingers. Suddenly, a putrid smell slices through the moist air. It's a stench that clings to the inside of your throat, acrid and unmistakable. Audrey wrinkles her nose, her expression one of disgust, mixed with alarm. Ugh, that smell, she murmurs, her voice barely a whisper over the soft murmur of the fog. Burning flesh, I nodded, swallowing hard against the bile rising in my throat. The smell brings back unwelcome memories of other darker places. The smell intensifies, the burning scent so overpowering now that our eyes begin to water. We push forward through every instinct screaming at us to turn back. Martinez looks up, a hand signaling us to stop. We freeze. The only sounds are our own heavy breathing in the distant faint lapping of waves against the shore. He points to a barely visible light ahead, not strong, but enough to pierce through the fog slightly. There, he hisses under his breath. The ground underfoot becomes firmer, the marsh giving way to dry, cracked earth that crunches beneath our boots. The sickly, sweet stench of burning flesh intensifies. I'm the first to see her, a small figure, I'm the first to see her, a small figure propped up against an old, gnarled tree. Her position is unnatural, arranged meticulously. As we draw closer, the horrific details come into sharp focus. It's a child, a young girl. Her face is painted to resemble a skull, stark white with hollow black eyes around, sunken eyes and dark, exaggerated lines stretching down her cheeks, mimicking the visage of Santa Moretti, the Mexican folk saint of death. Her small form is dressed in tattered robes with fluttered slightly with the breeze. Her hair is adorned with a crown of thorny roses, the sharp roses piercing her brow causing crimson rivulets that resemble tears of blood to trickle down her face. Her chest is open with surgically precise cuts, revealing a hollow cavity where her heart should have been. Inside, a small flame burns. The fire somehow contained, only charring the flesh around the edges of the wound, casting eerie shadows on her pale skin. Audrey gasps, her hand going to her mouth, 
her eyes wide with horror. Jesus, it's her, she murmurs, her voice breaking. It takes me a moment to understand. Then I see it. The girl from the locket. Fuck. Martina swears under his breath, his face set in a grim line as he radios for backup. We need CSI here, now, he barks into the handset, his voice rough with anger and something akin to fear. The commander barks orders to his team, setting up a secure perimeter around the girl. The area is marked with evidence flags, each flutter of the small, bright squares, a stark contrast to the somber surroundings. Audrey and I begin documenting everything with meticulous detail, our cameras clicking into the otherwise oppressive silence. As we inspect the body, it becomes disturbingly clear that there are signs of cannibalism. Bite marks, unmistakably human, mar the girl's limbs, the flesh torn away, and some places to reveal bone underneath. Around the child's form, the ground is littered with what appear to be votive items, candles still flickering weakly, a set of rosary beads, and oddly, a single cell phone lying a few feet from her body. It's an older model Nokia, probably a burner. I pull on a pair of latex glove with a snap and carefully pick up the device, ensuring not to smudge any prints that might be on it. I examine the battered old cell phone. The screen is cracked and smudged with grime, but it flickers to life under my touch. Asking for a six-digit passcode, I paused, staring at the prompt. I thumb the power button, cycling through the flickering options, and freeze when I remember Salazar's manic repetition of the word Dolce's, the single word hauntingly echoing in my mind. I think about how letters correspond to numbers on a phone keypad, much like the old 1-800 commercial numbers. It's a long shot, but given the lack of immediate leads, it's the only one we have. I began to match the letters to the numbers, typing them out tentatively. D3, U8, L5, C2, E3, S7. I hold my breath, half expecting it to be wrong. But then, the phone unlocks. I stare at the unlocked screen, my heart hammering in my chest. The dim light of the phone casts ghostly shadows across my fingers as I navigate through the cluttered interface. Amidst the jumble of apps and icons, a single video file stands out, labeled simply, Last Message. I tap on it, and the video begins to play. Martinez, Audrey, and the rest of the team huddle closer, their breath visible in the chilly night air. The footage is grainy, the colors washed out, but the image is unmistakable. It's the same girl we just found, only now she's alive, her eyes wide with a terror that chills me to the bone. She's dressed in a Santa Moretti costume, seated on a wooden chair in a dimly lit room. She glances off camera nervously, as if awaiting a cue or fearing a reprimand, before her eyes return to focus on the camera, her hands trembling slightly as she holds up a piece of worn paper, reading from it in a shaky voice. My name is Lucia Alvarez. I am 14 years old, and I am from Zamora, Michoacan. She begins, her voice a whisper. He says... He says you must follow these instructions exactly as I describe them. She reads, her eyes scanning the paper. Lucia's voice grows even more tremulous as she reads from the crumpled sheet. Each word spoke with reluctant precision. Step one, go to the old chapel of San Pedro on the outskirts of Ote Mesa. There... You will find an introverted cross buried 
in the attic. Audrey pulls out a pen and notepad, jotting down each word with a meticulous care. Her hands move swiftly, ensuring nothing is missed. Step two. Beneath the cross, you will find a box of bones belonging to the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Lucia's voice shakes as she continues, her fingers clutching the paper tightly. Step three. Place the bones on the stone altar. You will see the center of the chapel. Arrange the bones in a spiral form from largest to smallest towards the center. Step four. Light a candle in the eye sockets of the skull in honor of the Lord of the day and the winds. If you do not comply exactly, more like me will die. Lucia's eyes widen with a dawning realization of her fate. She glances off camera again, her voice trembling as she implores her captor. Please, I did what you asked. I don't want to die. Her plea is desperate, raw with the terror of a girl who knows she is speaking her last words. Tears stream down her face, smudging the white paint in dark lines, transforming her death mask into a tragic, melting visage. Her small frame trembles with sobs, and she clutches at the paper, crumpling it in her hands. The desperation in her eyes is unbearable. The screen goes black suddenly, the abruptness of it like a door slamming shut leaving only the hollow echo of Lucia's screams in the otherwise silent pre-dawn. The cries taper off, dwindling into a stifled whimper that chokes off mid-breath, leaving a chilling silence in its wake. Part 2 As the sun begins to rise, casting an eerie glow through the dense fog, the crime scene becomes a flurry of activity. CSI teams in white suits swarm the area, their movements meticulous as they comb through the marsh, documenting and collecting every scrap of evidence with clinical precision. Audrey and I watch them from a distance, our hands stuffed into our pockets of our jackets as a shield against the morning chill. Their careful movements unearth more than just the sad remnants of hurried flight. With each brush and marker set down, the layers of the night's horrors peel back, revealing deeper, darker secrets etched into the earth and the trees around us. One of the forensic technicians, a young woman with sharp eyes and a steady hand, calls us over. Hey, detectives, you need to see this. We make our way over, our boots sinking slightly into the softened earth. The technician points to a set of tracks leading away from the crime scene. They're unlike any shoe or animal print. These are deep, oddly shaped grooves that seem to twist unnaturally, almost as if the creature that made them was skimming rather than walking on the marshy surface. Could be some sort of dragging. Martina suggested, but his tone lacks conviction. I crouch down for a closer look. The tracks are irregular, spaced erratically, as if whatever made them was staggering or not entirely of this world. Each print had a sharp, almost claw-like feature at the end, suggesting whatever made them was either fully animal nor human. They led towards the dense underbrush, then disappear as if the marker had suddenly taken flight or simply vanished. Has this been cast yet? I ask, keeping my voice low. The tech nods. Yeah, we've got casts and photos, but there's something else. She leads me to the tree where we found the girl. 
At first glance, it looks like any other part of this morbid tabulao. But then she hands me a flashlight. Shine it here, he instructs. The beam catches on to something etched deeply into the bark. Carved symbols, crude yet deliberate, spiral up the trunk. Each symbol, jagged and deep, depicts scenes that are disturbingly ritualistic in nature. Human figures in various posts, po human figures in various poses of submission and agony, their limbs splayed outwards as if an offering. The central figure in the tableau is a towering skeletal figure, its skin peeled back to reveal muscle and bone. The flayed god, I whisper, recognition dawning as the details of the carvings become clearer. We're dealing with a cult, Audrey concludes, her voice steady despite the gruesome realization. After the initial shock of the gruesome crime scene, Audrey and I retreat back to the command tent to pour over the video of Lucia Alvarez. The setup is makeshift, a couple of laptops and monitors propped on a folding table, the humming of generators outside barely drowning out the eerie silence of the marshland. Let's run through this again, Audrey says, clicking on the video file labeled Ultimo Mensaje. The grainy footage flickers to life, Lucia's haunted face filling the screen. As the video plays, I focus on the background, looking for any detail that might tell us where it was taken. The room is dim, but there are shadows that suggest depth and the presence of objects just out of the camera's view. Audrey jots down notes as we watch, pausing the video at key moments to scrutinize the surroundings. There, I point out, pausing the video. In the corner of the room, barely visible, is a poster with distinctive markings. Perhaps a local band or a political advertisement. That poster might help us pinpoint the location. Audrey nods, zooming in on the image. We examine the poster, the resolution grainy, but just clear enough to make out the first letter of a word and the first letter of the second. New H. The visible text reads, followed by a partially obscured logo that could be a sun or a gear, the edges blurred and indistinct. We need to enhance this, see if we can pull out more details. Audrey suggests, already on her phone, contacting the tech team for image enhancement. My mind is racing. I recognize that logo from somewhere. Something I came across in a report. Or a briefing note, perhaps. Let's dig into this later. See if we can pull up anything on local businesses or landmarks with that name. As the low hum of the generator filled the air, Audrey leaned back in her chair, a frown creasing her brow. This lord of the underworld, who do you think that refers to? It's all a bit dramatic, like something out of a horror movie. I rub my chin, pondering. Hmm, it sounds like something Aztec or Mayan, maybe? My knowledge isn't exactly comprehensive, just bits and pieces of stories my mom used to tell me. Gods and spirits, all interwoven with lessons and warnings. None of that stuff particularly interested me. Pulling out my phone, I type in Lord of the Underworld, along with some key words from our current case, ritual, cult, Aztec. The search churns through data and within seconds, links to various articles and mythological databases pop up. One entry catches my eye. A piece on Maklan de Kutli, the Aztec god of death in the underworld. I go to images and see the god depicted as a skeletal figure, surrounded by motifs of decay and regeneration. I show the phone to Audrey, who leans over for a better look. That's our perp, huh? McClondacootley, I muse, struggling to pronounce the word itself. 
I scroll through more entries, but none provide a clear motive or reasoning behind such gruesome displays. It's like trying to read a book where half the pages are ripped out. What do you think he meant by, for those who have seen death closely but survived? That's just not random. It's targeted. I lean back against the flimsy chair, the metal creaking under my weight. I've got a bad feeling about this odd, I confess, feeling the weight of each word. It's like... It's like that message isn't just for anyone. It's for us. Audrey's eyes narrow, her analytical mind piecing together the unsaid. The Vasquez case she murmurs, the name hanging in the air like a cold breath. We came out of that by the skin of our teeth. Yeah. The memory sits heavy in my stomach. We'd walked through a nightmare landscape, body scattered, a community shattered. We decided to shift towards the hunt for the chapel described in Lucia's chilling video. We pour over maps of Ote Mesa and the surrounding areas, scouring every database and record we can access from any mention of the San Pedro Chapel. The name is common enough to make it a difficult search, but eventually we narrow it down to a few possible locations. One in particular, an abandoned chapel on the outskirts of Ote Mesa, stands out. It's isolated run down, and has a history of being a hot spot for illicit activities. With the chapel identified, we return to uncovering the killer's potential hideout. The forensic evidence collected at the crime scene proves invaluable. The peculiar claw-like tracks leading away from the scene area of particular interest. Upon closer examination, the forensic team uncovers soil discrepancies in the samples taken near the tracks. The analysis from the forensics team reveals tracks of minerals not typically found in the marshy outskirts of Ote Mesa. Instead, these minerals match those found in the more arid, rocky terrains to the north. Utilizing geological maps, we pinpoint several potential areas where this soil composition could have originated. It's a tedious process, cross-referencing environmental data with recent satellite imagery to narrow down the locations. It hit me that New H could be the start of a company's name, possibly a mining company, given the old minerals found at the crime scene. I open up a browser on one of the laptops, typing in mining company along with New Age and San Diego as additional search terms. The results are mostly news articles about the local industry, but nothing catches my eye. I refine the search, adding defunct or closed to the terms. After several attempts at refining keywords, a hit. An old article about a now-defunct mining company catches my attention. New Horizon Quarries. Look at this, I call over to Audrey, pointing at the screen. The article is from a local paper dated back several years, discussing the closure of New Horizon Quarries due to a series of legal and environmental issues. It mentions the company's last known operating location, a quarry on the northern edge of San Diego County, not too far from our current location. This can't be a coincidence. The unique mineral traces, the location, and now our potential link to a quarry. It all starts to form a disturbing picture. We decide it's worth a shot to check out this quarry. As Audrey and I huddled in the dim light of the command tent, the weight of what we discovered presses down on us. We're at a crucial juncture, and each decision a potential misstep in a dance with an unknown and deadly partner. Okay, let's think this through, I start, tapping a pen against the notepad filled with details from the night. 
We can't just follow these instructions blindly. It's obviously a trap or at least a diversion. Audrey nods, her face set in a determined grimace. Right, but we've got to engage somehow. Keep him thinking we're playing his game while we work our angle. We need to track this guy down before anyone else ends up like Lucia. The strategy is clear. Engage, but not on our terms. I sketched out a rough plan on a scrap of paper. We map out a risky two-pronged approach. Audrey and I, along with a few trusted members from Martinez's team, will head to the chapel as per the instructions in Lucia's video. We'll make a show of following the steps, careful to keep our actions visible enough to suggest compliance without actually fulfilling the ritual's darker requirements. Meanwhile, another team equipped with the best equipment and surveillance gear we have will scout out the quarry, hoping to catch the killer or whomever is orchestrating these events off guard. As the plan solidifies, I pull out my cell, dialing the number of our superior, Captain Barriott. The line clicks, his gruff voice perpetually tinged with a rasp of too many years on the job, crackles through the speaker. Castello, what's the situation? Barrett's voice is all business, the underlining concern barely noticeable beneath the surface. I lean against the cold metal of our makeshift command center, watching the early morning mist roll over the marshlands. Captain, We've got a lead on the murder. We think the perpetrator might be holed up in an abandoned quarry to the north of here. There's a pause, heavy with the weight of every bad outcome that could unfold from this conversation. You think or you know? Barrett's tone sharpens, slicing through the fog of uncertainties. We're nearly certain, sir, I say, walking him through the evidence in our plan. Barrett exhales heavily over the line, a low sound that carries all the weight of his experience and the ghosts of cases gone wrong. All right, Castello, but I'm holding you to it. You can't have another Alvarez mess on our hands. You get in, assess the situation, and get out. No heroics, understand? Uh, understood, sir. I assured him, feeling the gravity of his words. We'll handle it by the book. He grunts, a non-committal sound that's as close to an agreement as I'm likely to get from him. Keep me updated every step of the way. And Costello? Yes, sir. Be careful. This sounds like you're walking into a den of snakes with a stick. Make sure it's a big stick. The line goes dead, leaving a small echo of static that fades into the stillness of the morning. We spend the early part of the afternoon gearing up, poring over maps and checking our equipment twice. Audrey and I, along with a couple of other seasoned officers from Martinez's team, loading up our SUVs with everything we might need. Night vision goggles, body armor, and more firepower than I'd like to think necessary. As the late afternoon sun lifts the dense fog just enough to lend an eerie glow to the surroundings, our convoy heads out. Audrey and I are in the lead, SUV. The mood tense, but focused. We're heading to the chapel, the supposed site of the next ritual, according to Lucia's chilling message. Meanwhile, the second team is making their way to the quarry, moving in quietly with the hopes of catching our suspect off guard. We maintain open lines of communication, each vehicle filtered with radios tuned to a secure channel. The static crackles occasionally, the voice of Sergeant Rodriguez from the Sheriff's Department checking in. His tone clipped and businesslike. Team 2 approaching the quarry perimeter. All quiet so far. Copy that, I respond, keeping my eyes on the dusty road leading up to the chapel. 
The structure looms in the distance, an abandoned relic that looks like it hasn't seen a congregation in decades. Its isolated location makes it an ideal spot for nefarious deeds, far from prying eyes, yet here we are, about to pry. As we near the chapel, the air thickens with an uneasy stillness, the kind that speaks more of abandonment than peace. The structure itself casts long, sinister shadows across the cracked earth, its steeple jagged against the sky like a broken finger pointing accusingly at us intruders. Audrey kills the headlights as we approach, the last few hundred yards covered under the cloak of the vehicle's silent glide. We park a good distance away, out of sight, but not out of mind. Each step towards the chapel is measured, deliberate, our boots crunching softly against the dry earth. Keep your eyes peeled, I muttered to Audrey, scanning the windows of the chapel. They are dark, empty sockets in the fading daylight giving nothing away, but I can't shake the feeling of being watched. Martinez, who insisted on coming along, signals to his team. Two agents move to flank the building, their steps as silent as the grave. Another pair positions themselves at the back, cutting off any chance of escape. We're not just walking into a potential trap. We're ready to spring one of our own. I nod to Audrey, and together we step up to the heavy wooden front door of the chapel. It's slightly ajar, the dark interior beckoning us inside with an ominous promise. I push the door open with the barrel of my 12-gauge shotgun, letting the dim light from outside reveal the chapel's secrets. The inside of the chapel is as dilapidated as the outside. Pews are overturned and graffiti mars much of the walls. But it's the smell that hits us first. A mix of mold, decay, and something faintly metallic. Blood? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. Our lights sweep across the walls, catching on crude graffiti that speaks of dark rituals. Amidst the chaos, my beam settles on the altar at the far end of the chapel. Above it hangs an inverted cross on the table. Its wood, aged and splintered, swings slightly as if recently disturbed. I gesture to Audrey, pointing towards the cross. There, I whisper, my voice barely audible. Martinez, just a few steps behind me, nods, his expression grim. With a nod, I crouch down, pushing aside a pile of debris to reveal a small rectangular area that's been disturbed recently. The dirt is looser here, contrasting with the compacted filth around it. I use my hands, the cool soil sifting through my fingers until they met the hard edges of something solid. I found something, I announce. My voice low and steady despite the pounding in my chest. The others gather around as I pull at a large wooden box. It's old, the wood swollen for moisture, but it's what's inside that counts. I open the box slowly, hinges creaking quietly in the heavy silence of the chapel. Inside, a collection of bones lies in disarray. Femurs, ribs, vertebrae, even more chilling than the last. They are not uniform. Their sizes and shapes vary suggesting they belong to different individuals. Each bone bears the scars of violence, with cuts, marks, and scrapes, where flesh was once forcibly stripped. It's a gruesome patchwork of human remains, each piece telling a silent, horrific story of its own. Audrey, her face pale under the beam of her flashlight, catalogs each piece on her camera with a clinical detachment necessary to keep the horror at bay. We need to get those to the lab, she says, her voice steady. 
Each one of these could help us identify a victim, piece together this bastard's history. I start rearranging the bones into a spiral on the hardwood floor, more out of a forensic interest than any desire to play into the killer's narrative. Audrey watches closely, her camera clicking at intervals, capturing each phase of the arrangement. The pattern emerges slowly, a grim source of artistry in the way the larger bones curve outward, tapering to the smaller ones at the center. It's macabre and deeply unsettling, yet there's a method to this madness, a clue, perhaps. As I place the last bone, a small, oddly shaped skull at the center of the spiral, I feel a sense of dread pooling in my gut. The arrangement is too deliberate, each piece interlocking with the others in a way that suggests not just violence, but ritual. As I finish arranging the bones, the radio crackles to life, breaking the heavy silence in the chapel. Team 2 to Team 1, come in. Sergeant Rodriguez's voice is urgent, cutting through the static. I grab the radio, pressed the transmit button. This is Team 1. Go ahead, Sergeant. We've got something here, Rodriguez responds, his voice tense. You need to see this. Audrey scrambles to set up the live feed on her laptop. The screen flickers to life, showing grainy night vision images from the cameras mounted on the team's helmets. The footage is shaky, the camera angles shaky as each team member turns this way and that. The screen splits into multiple views, each one a chaotic snapshot of the quarry's rocky terrain. The harsh, white outlines of rocks and sparse vegetation jump out against the black background, but there's something else. Movement. Too fluid and quick to be human. My stomach turns as the camera of Rodriguez's helmet stabilizes for a moment, giving us a clear view. It's a cadaverous space carved into the side of the quarry. The walls rough and echoing the chaos outside. And there, mounted on the walls, are racks filled with human heads, their lifeless eyes staring out into the dark, empty space. The lower racks holding skulls, long stripped of flesh, each one bleached white by time and exposure. By the top rack, the top rack is a flesh set of horrors, heads of victims in various stages of decay, their features frozen in silent screams of agony. The sound that flood the live feed next are unlike any I've ever heard in years of service. A blood-curdling screech that pierces the air, followed by a flurry of Panic shouts in the unmistakable staccato of gunfire. Audrey and I watch helplessly, the images on the screen of chaotic jumble as Rodriguez and his team struggle to respond. Sergeant, talk to me, I barked into the radio, gripping the headset so tightly my knuckles turn white. There's a crackle of static, then a strained voice comes through. It's... Fuck, it's got me. I can't. I can hear Rodriguez scream in agony, sort of sounds that tells you it's not just pain, but raw primal fear. Through the grainy night vision footage, glimpses of the assailant flash intermittently, a blur of movement too swift to be clearly seen. But then, the camera jerks as Rodriguez falls to the ground, the view tilting crazily before stabilizing skyward. In that one brief, haunting moment, we see it. A creature with a sharp, elongated beak and massive talons swooping down with the ferocity of a raptor. The chaos on the screen abruptly turns into a horrifying stillness. As the screams and gunfire died down, the camera attached to Rodriguez's helmet captures a terrifying close-up. His head is pinned to the rocky ground by razor-sharp talons. 
the creature's grip unyielding. Blood pools around his neck, stark against the pale white moonlight rocks. A voice breaks through, ethereal and chilling, coming from just off screen. The night vision field blurs for a moment, then refocuses, and though the figure speaking is invisible, the voice envelops us, clear and disturbingly calm. You were warned, the voice says, its tone almost conversational, but underlaid with a cold seriousness. Instructions were given, not just to be heard, but to be followed, Detective Costello. Audrey and I exchanged a look, a mix of disbelief and terror as the killer called me out by name. Who are you? How do you know my name? I demand, my voice steady despite the uncertainty that grips me. I am a herald of the fifth sun, a harbinger of rebirth and destruction. This world, this era, its ending, and the new cycle must be initiated. The voice answers enigmatically. The talons around Rodriguez tightened, a grotesque adjustment that elicits another stifled scream from him, barely audible over the crackling radio. Please! His voice as a ragged whisper, a plea drawn out by the voice of the assailant. Complete the ritual, detective. The killer commands. I won't ask again. Audrey grips my arm, her fingers tight. Roman, we can't, we can't go along with this. It's madness. I nodded Audrey, my mind racing. We need to buy time, I murmur, keeping my voice low as I scan the chapel. I grab a candle from the altar, the wax firm and cold in my grip. With a flick of my zippo, the wick catches fire, casting a flickering, unsteady light that throws long shadows across the chapel's decrepit walls. I lower the candle into the eye socket of the skull, positioned at the center of the spiral of bones. The small flame seems absurdly delicate in the vast, dark emptiness of the space. The light of the candle shivers as if it senses the weight of the darkness around it. The skull's hollow sockets stare back at us, the flame reflected like a tiny beacon in the depths of its eyeless gaze. It's done, I say, my voice echoing slightly off the stone walls, more to convince myself that we're still in control than anything else. Arise, Quetzalcoatl, the voice says, its tone laced with an edge that makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. With a sudden sickening pop, the killer's talons tighten around Rodriguez's head, crushing it with terrifying ease. Blood sprays across the rocky ground, spattering the camera lens and obscuring the footage. Before we can process the brutality that unfolded, a sound chills us to my core. The rattling of bones, not from the feed, but right behind us in the chapel. We whirl around, weapons raised, my heart pounding in my throat. The bones on the chapel floor tremble and clack against each other with a sound like distant thunder. As we watch, frozen in place, they begin to resemble themselves, each piece moving with unnatural precision. The larger bones form a base spiraling upwards, stacking into a tight serpentine coil that rises from the ground like some grotesque monument. The coil thickens and then flesh begins to appear, manifesting out of the chill, damp air. It wraps around the bones like clay being molded by an unseen potter's hands. 
The flesh is pale and sick, glistening under the dim light as if it were wet. Muscles twitch and contract as they form, binding to the bones with sinewy snaps that echo in a hollow chapel. The creature's body elongates, stretching out into a serpentine form while scales start to cover the newly formed flesh, shimmering down the dim light of our flashlights. The scales are an indescent array of colors, shifting from green to a vibrant turquoise, each one catching the light like a gemstone. As the final touch, bright, needle-like feathers sprout along its spine, framing its form into a mockery of regal splendor. The creature's head forms last, with a jaw that splits distantly remnants of a snake's, capable of dislocating to swallow large prey. Yet its eyes, when they open, are undeniably human, deep and intelligent. Audrey lets out a strangled cry, covering her mouth with her hand as she turns away from the screen. I feel bile rise in my throat, the horror of the situation hitting me like a physical blow. The creature's feathers, bright and sharp as blades, fluff aggressively. A clear prelude to an imminent attack. My voice is sharp as I shout, take cover to my team as the feathers detach and hurtle towards us like a hell of arrows i drive behind an overturned pew just as the feathers thud into where i stood mere seconds ago the wood splinters loudly under the impact the fragments peppering the air like sharp metal. an agonizing scream pierces the chaos I spin around, expecting to see Audrey safely huddled behind me. But my heart sinks as my eyes find her instead lying vulnerable in the center aisle. Her body is twisted awkwardly, her face contorted in pain as she is clutching her left arm, blood soaked through her fingers and staining the cold stone floor. A few feet away, Martinez lay motionless a dark pool expanding around him. A feather had torn right through his chest with brutal efficiency, the tip protruding from his back, pinning him to the ground like a grotesque specimen in a collection. Audrey, pale and grimacing in pain, meets my eyes across the room. There's an unspoken understanding between us, a shared history of close calls and narrow escapes, but nothing like this. Peeking out from the makeshift shelter, the eerie silence of the chapel weighs heavily, broken only by a low hissing sound and the distant drip of blood echoing off stone. The creature slithers with sinuous grace between the shadows, its scales catching the dim light, creating a tapestry of light and darkness across the floor. I know the monster is using her as bait. It wants us out in the open so it can finish us off. But I can't leave Audrey to die. Not like this. Not when I might still help her. And that, dear listeners, is the end of part one and part two of this amazing series. I hope you have enjoyed if you are awake long enough to finish this, please leave a comment below letting me know if you would like to hear parts three through six. And as I always like to say, in the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.